By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at a match played at the Hill Giant Cup. We are back in Hilversum, the Netherlands. This is round number three and we're going to look at Chris, who's playing a deck that I've called Beast Troll. It's a deck with Guardian Beasts, Set Trolls, Neveneral's Discs and of course some Blue Splash for Power Cards. And he is taking on David S. And David is playing with a deck that he's called Underworld Moon. It's red and black, no blue in this one, so just red and black. And I mean, this is looking really, really good. He's playing with Underworld Dreams and all those Underworld Dreams shenanigans that you would expect from a deck like that. So two really strong decks that have their little tricks to get maximum value out of their plays. Now, before I start with the deck decks on both of these decks, I would just like to point out that as always, you can also choose to skip this section Go to the matches first. I know some people enjoy just looking at the game first, looking at the decks later. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of the uh, timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and it'll take you straight to the games. And here I'm going to continue with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the deck of uh, Chris. And here we see the deck of Chris. Well, actually not the deck of Chris. I don't have a deck photo, unfortunately, but I do have some cards that are key cards in his deck. I kind of know what he wants to play. So I've called his deck Beast Troll for a reason because he's playing with a playset of Guardian Beasts and a playset of Setch Trolls. Now obviously both creatures go really well with Navanerol's Disc. Maybe first take a look to discuss Guardian Beast and what it does again. It's one black and three for two four from the Arabian Nights Summoned Guardian that reads as long as Guardian Beast is untapped your non-creature artifacts cannot be further enchanted, destroyed or taken under someone else's control. Right? So, Nevenerol's Disc, if you activate it and you have Guardian Beast in play, the disc does destroy the beast, but the Nevenerol's Disc comes back into play, right? So you can use it again. And Setch Troll, of course, works really well with the Nevenerol's Disc because this is a 2-2 creature for 1 black and 2, but if you have a Swamp in play, it becomes a 3-3 and for 1 black you can regenerate it. So obviously, when you pop the disc, you can regenerate your Setch Troll. So both creatures go really well with the set stroll. And then I've uh, shown a brain geyser, uh, brain geyser here as card number four. And the reason for that is that he plays, I believe, with all the power cards. I'm not quite sure if he's playing with the time twister. We'll just have to see. But I do believe he's playing with ancestral recall and time walk and then brain geyser as well. Now, obviously, you know, those are just great cards to splash in any deck. Now, I don't know a lot about the rest of his deck. Another really nice synergy, of course, with Guardian Be Beast is Chaos Orp and Guardian Beast. But of course, Chaos Orp is a restricted card, so we'll only see one of those. But he's probably also playing Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. So with the Tutor, he can look up, you know, uh, it, it, his, his Chaos Orp. And then if he already has a Guardian Beast in play, that's, of course, a brutal combo to have. And I have to say, in general, I think in this matchup, because I do have a deck picture of uh, David's deck, I think the problem for David here is really going to be the Nevenerals Disc. Because the Nevenerals Disc destroys everything, and David plays a lot with permanence. He plays a lot with enchantments, Underworld Dreams, Blood Moon. He wants to have those enchantments out on the battlefield, and of course that makes you vulnerable to a card like Nevenerals Disc. So I'm kind of worried about that. Now obviously he also has some weapons against it. Actually talking about that, let's take a look at David's deck, Underworld Moon. And here we see the deck of David. So I mean, this deck is really built around Underworld Dreams, right? So Underworld Dreams is a card from black for three black to cast an enchantment from Legends uh, that reads, whenever your opponent draws a card, he takes a damage. So obviously what you want to do when you play with Underworld Dreams, you want to play with cards like Howling Mind because then your opponent's going to draw more cards. But at the same time, you want to have some kind of lock to make sure that your opponent cannot do a lot with all those cards. I think that's where the uh, the Blood Moon comes in. So Blood Moon turns all the non-basic lands into mountains. And usually, you know, unfortunately in this matchup, you know, the opponent here of David Chris is playing with a lot of artifacts, playing with Red himself. So the Blood Moon is not going to be that good, but it still will have value, you know, because it takes out all the non-basic lands, the factories, the Loas, and just, you know, he also needs some black mana. So that's going to be quite difficult, I guess, you know, for Chris, because he's, he's going to play with a lot of lands that also provide him blue, because that's the color that he splashed in. So those duels will all be turned into mountains. So that's quite interesting. And of course, he's also playing with uh, a Wheel of Fortune, which is really good with Underworld Dreams, because, you know, it forces you to draw seven cards. That means seven damage for your opponent, right? Talking about damage that way, there's also Winds of Change. Winds of Change, one red to cast a card from Legends. And what it says is you shuffle back the cards that you have in your hand and then draw that amount of cards. So if you've got six cards 
cards in hand, you shuffle them back in your library, you draw six cards. Now, that doesn't sound really, you know, that great, could be handy, but when you've got Underworld Dreams in play, this is a direct damage spell, you know? If your opponent's got seven cards in hand, you can deal seven points of damage with just one Winds of Change, if, of course, you have that Underworld Dreams on the battlefield. So that is super, super. Talking about the Underworld Dreams again, there's, of course, another strategy here in the deck. The Howling Mines were great with Underworld Dreams, because if you've got a mine, you deal two damage to your opponent if you also have a Dreams. Um, and one of the things that David told me when he sent me the deck picture is that he's replaced the Icy Manipulators in this deck, so they're out of the deck for Relic Barriers. And Relic Bar Barrier, of course, a card from Legends for two that reads tap it, tap target artifact. Now, this is great in combination with Howling Mine because Howling Mine is one of the two artifacts in Magic that you can turn off by tapping it. The other one is Wind Orb. So if you tap the Howling Mine after you drew two cards from it, then that means that your opponent is only going to draw one because the Howling Mine is tapped and not activated, you know? And of course, this is important because then David, if he plays the Howling Mine and doesn't have an Underworld Dreams, um, you know, on the battlefield, he can simply deactivate it with the uh, Relic Barrier. So that's, that's a pretty good strategy. So remember, the, the Icy Manipulators here are not in the, in the deck, but the Relic Barriers are. Another thing I like about this deck, and maybe you've noticed it already, is check out that sideboard. Yeah, exactly. A lot of creatures. Now check out the main 60. No creatures. He's playing two Abyss. So he's got this sideboard backup plan. So maybe the opponent after the first game is going to be like, okay, I figured your deck out. You've got Underworld Dreams deck. I'm going to take out my uh, my creature removal, you know, my swords to plowshares and stuff. I'm going to put in a lot of tranquility, extra disenchants. But then all of a sudden after sideboarding, bam, all your creatures turn up on the board and your opponent just took out all the, uh, all the creature removal, you know? So that's, of course, a, a strategy, a known strategy that you can do, and I think it's a really good one. I, I'm also liking to see a Sheevan Dragon in there, in those uh, in those creatures there on, in the sideboard. So I'm, I'm quite excited to see what David's going to do after the first match. Now, again, I think the the unfortunate thing here for David in this matchup is that Nevenerals disc. He really needs to find a way to deal with the disc because also if we look... At, you know what he has he doesn't actually have any shatters he doesn't have a shatter storm um i mean he does have some way to deal with the guardian beast right he's got a fireball he's got of course the bolts and he's got two abysses in the deck so abyss is then great it's gonna probably kill the uh, uh the guardian beast but it, it's gonna be tough because i'm really maybe i'm overestimating the neveral disc in this matchup let me know in the comments if you think so but i think the disc could play a key role in this matchup. Anyway, it doesn't really matter what I think. I'm hoping for an exciting, cool game. I am loving both of these decks. And I have to say this Underworld uh, Moon sideboard plan, I am really, really digging it, David. So without further ado, let's go to the match. Round number three here at the Hill Giant Cup. Game number one, here we go. So we've got Chris sitting on the left with his Guardian Beast deck, black and red, mainly with a blue splash. And then on the right, we've got David. And he is playing with his Underworld Moon deck. So Underworld Dreams and Blood Moon, it's strictly black and red. Look at the hand there of Chris. We see a lot of discs. And here we see a Swamp and I think a Bolt. Let's have a look who's going to be on the play. I guess here it's Chris starting with the Batlands. There's a lot of glare on that land, but we know it's a Batlands. And passing the turn to David. Let's see what David can do. There's a Swamp just to pass. So both players taking it easy. No Moxa, no Lotuses. There we see an underworld, sorry, an underground sea. No underworld sea. <laughs> I'm a little confused with all the underworld dreams that we're probably going to see in this matchup. There's a relic barrier. So remember, uh, we saw the deck photo earlier of uh, David. He's not playing with icy manipulators. He's playing with relic barriers instead. There's a strip mine of Chris and also a pass turn. And let's see if David can find a howling mine. That would be quite nice with, of course, the relic barrier on the board. There is a Swamp. Tapping it now, tapping two, and there's a Howling Mine. Okay, so he can tap the Mine now to deactivate it. That means Chris only draws one card. And then when it's uh, David's turn, it's untap, upkeep, draw. So he's going to draw two cards because by that time, the Howling Mine will be untapped. So that's re a really nice draw engine for him. Here we see a Maze of If. It's quite useless at the moment. This is not really what you want to play if you're uh, if you're uh, Chris. There are two cards here, and I think is that an Underworld Dreams? It's hard to see, or is it a Winds of Change? Yeah, it's a Winds of Change, and there's a Swamp. It seems. 
I mean, one of the things he could do is just, you know, play the winds of change, play a swamp, play the winds of change, and just kind of hope that he draws into uh, an underworld dreams. But there's no third black, though. Tapping the mind, passing the turn. Tapping three, and okay, we're gonna see a mind twist for two. Is there going to be a response, for example, a bolt at instant speed on the life total of Chris? It looks like there's not, so Chris is going to take two cards from David here. Let's have a look. A dark ritual and a winds of change. So this is some important information for Chris. Now that he's seeing the winds of change, he's probably like, okay, I think I know what's going on here because that card sees little play outside of the uh, Underworld Dreams decks. There's a vice there. First, there's going to be a strip mine. He's going to strip the underground sea. Probably to, to uh, prevent any potential counter magic from Chris. Let's see what else he's going to do. There's a Swamp number three. He's got Howling Mine in hand as well, and I believe a Vice. Not quite sure though, so there's the other Mine. And there's the Vice, okay, yeah, this makes sense. So now he's just gonna go like, you know what, Chris? Draw three cards, it's fine. And then hopefully later, he'll take some damage. Now remember, um, you know, David of course stripped away the C, so that's all part of the strategy. He is tapping down the Mine though. There's some damage here for Chris. He's going to drop to 18 and draw two cards because of that one untapped Howling Mine. And that's always risky, you know, because you're giving your opponent an extra card, but it does go well, of course, with the Vice strategy. An effect tree here hitting the board and a pass. So that's actually quite good news for David here. I think David is, is going to have so much card advantage. If he can now also find an Underworld Dreams, he's in a really good position. He's going to draw three cards. He's got three black. Can he find an Underworld Dreams here? Another Swamp. Another Vice. Okay, that's pretty good as well, of course. Tapping three for a Blood Moon. Yeah, and this is ideal because now he's got four mountains. Although, it's actually not that bad for Chris. Four is a magic number in his deck. Remember, Navanerl's disc casting cost four. So maybe this move is going to cost him the game, actually. Wow, that'll be really interesting to see. So first he's going to take damage. A lot of damage because of the double vice. So four points of damage. Going to drop to 14. I mean, all he needs here is a disc. Just drop the disc, tapping four. There's the Nevenerals disc, yeah. Oh man, it was already in his opening hand, of course. And this Blood Moon is really backfiring towards David. This is a huge problem for him. Remember, he's not playing with any artifact removal. He is finding their Underworld Dreams, that's huge, but he doesn't want to play it out probably. Or what he could do is play out the Dreams, play out some Winds of Changes, deal a lot of damage, Passing the turn, and of course, before draw, he can activate the disc. Maybe he can find a way of killing him before that happens. Gonna tap two. Ooh, Chaos Storm. This is key. He needs to hit the vice. If he hits the, the black vice, sorry, the Nevenerals disc, it's game. He's won it. But he's gotta hit it. He's gotta hit the disc. Can he hit the disc? And he hits the disc. Very sweet. Well done, David. Disc is out of the window. Now he's probably gonna play out his Underworld Dreams and I think the game's in the pocket here for David. This Chaos Orb was absolutely key for him. It almost slipped out of his hand because of that Blood Moon. So there's the pass. Of course, I mean, Chris is not dead yet, but he's going to take three points of damage from the Howling Mine and the Underworld Dreams alone. So he'll drop to 11. And then he's gonna take damage from the Vice and no Winds of Change being played. So he's gonna take six points of damage, drop to eight. Then there's a bolt, of course, at instant speed. Could have played it, I think, before he took the vice damage, by the way. That could have saved him a life point as well. Now he's gonna draw three cards, gonna drop to five. 
Exactly, he's gonna drop to five. Now he needs another disc, but even if he can find another disc, he's dead exactly the end of the road here. He really needed that Nevenerol disc, and look at that, there were two more bolts in hand here by David. And now the big question is, remember David's deck, right? He's got a sideboard plan. So, you know, he can put in the creatures now. I wonder if he's going to do that. I really, really, really wonder. Anyway, both players are gonna shuffle up, both players are gonna sideboard, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. Chris, of course, on the play after losing that first one, starting with a Badlands and a pass. Let's see what David can do. Starting with a Swamp and a pass, so no Dark Ritual into Underworld Dreams. Which is actually really good for David if he can have that on turn one, but it's not meant to be. There's a Felwer Stone, a lot of glare on that stone, but we know it's a Felwer Stone. Card from the Dark, two to cast. When you tap it, it can produce any colored mana that your opponent can with their basic lands. Well, with their lands, actually. Anyway, there's a Chaos Orb from David. The Chaos Orb that kind of saved him the game there in game number one. Because Chris almost stabilized with the disc. Let's see what he can do. Tapping three, playing a set draw. So taking a little risk here because he doesn't have a, a black open to regenerate. But he also sees, of course, that David doesn't have a red source for a potential bolt. There's the red source though. And he's also kind of inviting, exactly inviting uh, David here to use his Chaos Orb on the set. And that's exactly what he does. And I think if you're Chris, you're kind of okay with this. You're like, okay, I've traded a Setch for a Chaos Orb. Now that Chaos Orb is, is at least out of the window for the remainder of this uh, game number two. Looks like he wants to tap a black. Perhaps play, yeah, there's a Dark Ritual into Hypnotic Spectre. There's a pass. Are we going to see a Bolt on the Hippie? Hypnotic, really one of those cards you've got to deal with. There's a pass though, of course, Bolt being an instant. But there are some mana issues here for Chris and that's really unfortunate for him. There's the attack for two. There's the Bolt, I guess. Yep, there's the Bolt. Killing the Hippie. There's three, and there's another Hippie though. Ancestral Recall. And I think this recall is really important for Chris because he's stuck on lands. He really needs to find a land drop here. That ancestral recall is going to help him finding what he needs. Drawing a card for turns. So that means four new cards in his hand. There has to be a land in there, right? There has to be. Or a Mox, or another Felwer Stone, or a Soul Ring. I mean, something. Okay, this is pretty good. Library of Alexandria, of course, the card from Arabian Nights. It lets you draw a card by tapping it if you've got seven in hand. Tapping four here. Ooh, again. That is so unfortunate here for Chris. Again, the Mind Twist losing the Demonic Tutor. That is unfortunate. The good news, though, for him is that he still has that Hippie to attack with. There's the attack. Chris is going to lose a copy artifact. So we, we're starting to get to know Chris's deck a little bit better. We're seeing that he's also playing with copy. So I guess blue is a pretty big, uh, big color in his deck. It's not just there uh, to splash the blue power. There is a tap for two. Are we going to see another Felwer Stone? I do believe I see a Guardian Beast in his hand there. Yeah. It's of course also important here for Chris that he kind of counts his cards. I'm not quite sure how many cards he has in hand. Okay, playing a set there. So I guess he's got like five in hand or something. Passing the turn. There's the attack for two. And now he can of course lose that Guardian Beast again. Okay, wow. That's really sweet to see that card. But it's now out of the game, unfortunately. There is a set troll. There's a counter spell on the troll, though. There's a pass, but things are not looking great for Chris. And of course, that card's Ali from Cairo. It took me a moment there to think, okay, what's the name of the card again? And what the card does is, as long as it's in play, your life total always stays on one. You cannot die, you know? If you're, on, if you're lower than one, your life total stays on one. There's a guardian beast here hitting the board. But I mean, things are looking quite good for uh, for David. 
I guess the only problem for David here is the fact that he can only deal 2 damage a turn and there's 5 damage on the board here for Chris. Which is actually a pretty big deal now that I think about it. There's a red, only one card in hand for David. I mean, he needs to find, you know, something to deal with the creatures. There's an attack for 5, so he's going to drop to 12. There's a pass. If he can find a land and a Sengir Vampire, that would be quite nice for him. There is an Hypnotic Spectre in hand. I cannot see that other card, though. Tapping 3, playing the Hypnotic Spectre. There's a counter spell on the Spectre. Yeah, and this is this is a mistake here, of course, from David. It's always easy when you look back at these games and point these things out, but of course you want to attack first with Hypnotic Spectre, forcing Chris to discard that counter spell, and then in the second main play your creature or play your spell, whatever you want to do. But like I said, it's really easy here from my comfy chair to look back at these games. I've made this uh, these, these type of mistakes myself as well. There's the attack for two. And uh, Chris here dropping to 12, but it's actually looking quite good for Chris. I mean, when he lost all the cards in his hand, I was kind of like, okay, it's looking really good for David, but there's just so much pressure here. There's a Brain Geyser. That is quite nice. Brain Geyser for three. There's a Bolt on the Sedge. That is a good move by David here, really waiting for that, for that moment to play that Bolt. Now, that's well played. So three cards here for Chris. Didn't have a land drop yet. There's another Guardian Beast in hand. Looks like he's going to pass the turn. And of course there's the attack. So Chris dropping to 10. And he's losing a City of Brass. And an Underworld Dreams here. Okay, that can kind of maybe tip it towards his advantage. So Chris now on 8 is going to take a damage from the Dreams. Going to drop to 7. Obviously I'm rooting for Chris actually here to win it. Because I would love to see a game number 3. They're very exciting decks to look at. And I love the uh, tra um, transitional sideboard by David. There is another Beast. Ooh, David dropping to five. Exciting stuff. I mean, next turn he could drop to one, and then if Chris has a bolt, I think I would still attack here with the hippie, because you know if you're, you're yeah, exactly you're if, whether you're on three or or you're on one, it doesn't really matter. Look at that, the shatter. There's another dreams. Oh, I think he's gonna make it. I think he's gonna make it. He's gonna drop to three. Yeah, the next turn. If Chris can find a bolt, he's got the game. Gonna drop drop to three. There's a land attack. David's gonna go to one. Then he's gonna take his turn. No cards in hand for Chris. Nothing. And yep, David's gonna win here, but wow, what an exciting, what an exciting match this was. I really enjoyed it. Yes, it ends up to be a 2-0 for David. Well done with this Underworld Moon deck, but it was a lot of fun. And, and like I said, I love the transitional sideboard from David. I think it really worked. That de deck by Chris is also looking quite interesting. Maybe, um, Chris, if you're uh, looking at this video, you can let us know in the comments below. You can give us some more information about your deck. It's looking super interesting. I, I've seen it a few times uh, before at the tournament, I believe, and uh, it looks like a very strong and original deck. Thank you both for showing your skills right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And that was the episode for today. And if you've enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment, and or share it on your socials. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. And if you want to see more of the channel or more of this tournament, I should say, make sure that you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Okay, now that you've done that, thank you so much for joining here. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you for being subscribed to Timmy Talks. And basically supporting the channel by watching my videos. Thank you so much for that. There is one other thing that you could do though. If you really enjoy the content that I make, you can support me as a content creator by joining my Patreon program by becoming a patron of Timmy Talks. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks for all the details and it already starts with just $1 a month. And for that measly dollar, you get access
access to the Timmy Talks Discord. You can play in the Timmy Talks online tournaments. And you can also, of course, chat to other patrons, maybe even play a game with me. And your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video, including this one. Let's take a look at our wonderful, wunderbar, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Here we go. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomaar gezien.